the fifth book of Eusebius of Caesarea. Such as these, then, are the proofs of the divine manifestation of the common Savior of all, Jesus the Christ, which have been thus far visible to the eyes, showing forth at once the divine words and deeds. For in ancient times, the words of which we have already spoken, as to things which should come to pass, were simply heard. Those, I say, which he prophesied to his disciples when he was near and in their presence. But now, in our times, the fulfillment of these things is openly viewed in fact, with powers eclipsing that of all mortal nature. And if men will not be persuaded of these things, we ought not to wonder, because man is accustomed so to resist the clearest things possible, as to dare to oppose in his assertions even the existence of a universal providence, and thus also even to deny God himself. And thus, disingenuously, will he also contend against many other things to which the truth itself bears testimony. But, as the injurious conduct of these detracts in no respect from the word which is in its own nature true, so also will the wickedness of the unbelief of men injure in no respect the evident excellency of the Godhead of our Savior. Let us not deign, therefore, even in word, to attach ourselves to these. For those whom the works of God will not persuade, the word of man will too abject to move. Nevertheless, let us again take up the more vigorously those things against such which we formerly investigated by questions in proof of the Gospels. If therefore a lie one should, after all this, impugn the truth and dare disingenuously to affirm that the Christ of God was not such as we believe he was, but was a magician, seducer, and impostor, we would present to him as an infant in mind those things which we also formerly investigated. Against those who suppose that the Christ of God was magician and deceiver. Let us now ask then, whether there ever was a man heard of at any period who, as a magician or deceiver, was also a teacher of humility, meekness, purity, and of every other virtue, and whether it is just to call by these names him who would not allow that men should even look upon women with evil desire, and whether he could be a magician who delivered the chief philosophy by teaching his disciples that the indigent should of their wealth adhere to him, and that compassion and liberality should abound with them, and whether he could be a magician who forbade the assembling together of ferocious and tumultuous inhabitants, and taught them to love the retirement only which devotes itself to the word of God. How could he, who deterred from every species of falsehood, and commanded that men should honor truth above all things, that they should not stand in need of a true oath, much less a false one, be justly named a magician? But what need can there be that I should now say many things on this point? Since we may readily inform ourselves from his own words, which have even to this day been preached throughout the whole earth, what the sort of conduct was which was disseminated by him in the world. Every one who loves the truth will confess of him not only that he was neither magician nor deceiver, but was the word of God in truth, and the teacher of the divine philosophy and righteousness, and not of this common philosophy of the world. But the things pertaining to his form of doctrine were such as these. Come then, let us inquire whether this his error consisted in any of many things of his teaching. Observe then, was it not God the King of all, him alone, of whom it is written that he is the cause of every good thing that he taught and presented to his disciples? And do not the words of his doctrine to this very time rise the mind of every Greek and barbarian in existence to the God who is supreme, to him, I say, who is the maker of the heavens and of the earth, and of the whole world, making them overleap all visible nature, everything fabricated? Was this then his error? Or 
was it that he did not allow those to worship many gods to whom it had been made clear from this worship of God only that he could not be convicted of falsehood and who had fallen after their head on account of this real error? But this was not new, nor was it his word only, but that of those Hebrews, friends of God, who arose in ancient times, and from them it was that these recent true philosophers were aided in these great performances, and gave in to their doctrines, the wise men of Greece too, glorying in the divinations of their deities, have put it thus on the record of the Hebrews, that wisdom came to the Chaldeans alone, and the Hebrews purely worshipped the essence of the person of God, the King of all. If then those ancient friends of God, those to whom these divinations have more particularly home testimony, did raise the act of worship, directing it to the God who is over all, how should we confess of him that he was a deceiver and not a most wonderful teacher who has extended this worship of God as to the things which were known only in former time to these descendants of the heads of the Hebrew fathers to all mankind, and this to such a degree that no more, as in those times a few, and those easy to be numbered, hold the orthodox faith respecting God, but thousands of congregations of barbarians at once, and of those who in ancient times were perfectly savage, also of the wise and men of Greece, of those, I say, who now, like the prophets and just men of old, have been taught in the worship of God solely by means of his power and of his instruction. But let us also investigate this third consideration. Was it then for this that they called him a deceiver? because he taught that men should no more honor God with the slaughter of bulls or with the sacrifices of irrational animals, neither with blood and fire nor with incense, which are of the earth, because these things are of small value and earthly. They showed that they could never comport with the nature which is immortal and incorporeal, determined also that to keep the commandments of God and by their means to purify both the soul and body was more acceptable and becoming to God than any sort of sacrifice. Inculcated, too, that men should be careful to become like God, both in enlightenment of mind and in the knowledge of his worship. And should any one of the Greeks find fault with these things, let him know that it is not to be imagined that the things so received are against even those of his own teachers, who have put much together on this matter that men should not suppose they honored God by means of blood and the sacrifices of irrational animals, or by those of fire, smoke, and the fumes of fat. We know, too, that we are after these things, taught by him that the world was made, and that these heavens, the sun, the moon, and the stars are the work of God, and that it is not right that we should worship these, and not him who is the maker and creator of them all. It may be well, therefore, for us to see how he could have deceived men, from whom we have learned to think that this system of things is nothing new, but is that of the Hebrews, the ancient friends of God. Even this sentiment was also from these famous philosophers. They delivered these same particulars, affirming that these heavens, the sun, the moon, and the stars, and the whole world were also made by him, who is the creator of all things. He also taught us to believe that the soul which we possess is immortal, and that it is in no respect like the animals that are irrational, but that the faculties within it resemble the powers of God. He likewise taught that all those who were barbarian and ignorant should at once make this their own, and be, and know. And how was it that we were not made wise by those sages among the Egyptians, or by the Greeks who made broad their foreheads, those who said that the soul which was in man was in no respect better in its essence than were gnats, fleas, worms, or reptiles, nor even than the soul of the serpent, the viper, the bear, or the panther, and that swine as to their soul differed in no respect from men. And that after these things, he perseveringly admonished men of the judgment of God and of the punishments and vengeance, things from which we cannot be exempt 
which are recorded against the wicked, also of the promises of eternal life, of the kingdom of heaven, and of the life of happiness with God, respecting the just. Whom then did he deceive? Did he not rather stimulate men to hasten on to virtue because of the victories reserved for the righteous, and to flee from and repel from them every vice because of the punishments to be inflicted on the wicked? Such then, being the instructions contained in the doctrinal ordinances of our Savior, what room does there remain for imagining that we should suppose him to have been a deceiver and magician? But let us also investigate these things. When a magician associates his companions with the things of this vice, like to what men does he make them? Is it not to magicians, deceivers, and fabricators of magical drugs, in all respects like himself? Was there ever then a man found among the whole Christian race who fabricated magical rites or drugs from the doctrine of our Savior? There is no such thing existing for any man to say but the contrary to this, that they have been seen passing over to the precepts of the philosophy which is divine. How then can he be justly styled other in truth than the teacher of the life which worships God, the common Savior of all, who became throughout the whole habitable world and to all nations the sole cause of purity and of holiness of life? and of the knowledge inculcating the worship of the Creator of all things. Those two who adhered to him from the first, as well as those who afterwards received the traditionary account of the manner of their conversation, were, as to all these matters, so far removed from suspicion of evil and bitterness that they did not even allow the sick to do many things which the many dared to do, either that they should write charms upon tablets, or make use of amulets, or that they should in their minds have respect to those who promised to use enchantments, or that they should prescribe for the persons of the sick as cures for complaints, either the fumes of roots, or of apples, or of any other similar things. Of these things were therefore excluded from the doctrine of our Savior, nor was there ever a Christian to be found who used amulets or enchantments, or the means of written tablets, or indeed any other forms allied to these, the indiscriminate use of which was in repute among the many. What then can be said against the men who had been instructed in these things, so as to cast the imputation on them, of their having been the disciples of a master who was a magician, when, behold, the association of anyone among the disciples who promised any new doctrine was severely reprehended? Those men, therefore, both of art and science, to whom he was the cause of their Christian instructions, fully confessed of him that he was much their superior in these respects. For, even as physicians are witnesses of the goodness of the doctrine of their master, so of geometricians, who has assigned any other instructing heads except geometricians, and of arithmeticians except arithmeticians, and in like manner, of the magician, the best witnesses as to these things have been his disciples, who have always fully resembled their master, and have done as he did. But no man has ever been found, during all these years, a magician, and at the same time a disciple of our Savior, when, behold, kings and governors have, during the whole of these times, made the most careful inquiries into these things, by means of the worst torments. And thus indeed, Neither was there any magician, his disciple, so as to be left free and exempt from every sort of condemnation, being only reduced by them, the persecuting emperors, to sacrifice. But that our discourse may not wander from Scripture, take the proof of these things even from the writings of those primitive acquaintances and disciples of our Savior, as found in the book of their own Acts. So they wrought upon those of the Gentiles who received their doctrine that many of these who formerly accused them of magic so entirely changed their conduct that they boldly brought forward the abominable books which they had formerly kept secret to them in the midst of the assemblies and threw them into the fire in the presence of all. Hear then the statement of these things which runs thus. The greater part then of those who practice magic brought in their books 
and burnt them in the presence of all men. And they reckoned the price, and it was found that they were worth fifty thousand pieces of silver. Such, therefore, were the disciples of our Savior, and such was the entire power of the word which they put forth in their discourses with their hearers that it became fixed in the depths of their souls, were so struck and inclined that every one took up the resolution no more to suffer those things to remain hidden, which by the many had formerly been implicated in error, but that these secret things should be brought out into the light, and that they should become witnesses against themselves of their own former wickedness. Such also were those who became their disciples, so pure, noble in soul, and abundant in love, that they allowed nothing impure to remain concealed within them, but on the contrary, they gloried and exalted in their change from vice to virtue. Since, therefore, the disciples of our Savior were seen to be such, must not their master have first been much more excellent? But if you wish to know from those who are disciples of what sort their master was, you have tens of thousands of the disciples of the precepts of our Savior, even to this time of whom there are multitudes of congregations of men who have armed themselves against the lusts of the nature of the body and have accustomed themselves to preserve their minds uninjured by any of the evil passions. Those, I say, who have passed their whole lives and grown old in purity and have put forth from the provisions of his word the most brilliant examples to others. Nor was it that men only were in this manner attached to him and became philosophers, but also tens of thousands of women throughout the whole creation, those, I say, who like priestesses of the supreme God attached themselves to the most exalted service and apply themselves to the love of the wisdom which is heavenly, and on the generation of the body they cast contempt, giving all care to the soul, keeping themselves in purity from everything sordid and unclean, and extending their desires to all holiness and to virginity. The Greeks, indeed, sing of one shepherd who left his place for the sake of philosophy, and him they hawk about here and there. This was Democritus, they also expressed their astonishment at one Crates, who gave his possessions to his citizens. He then took with him himself alone, and boasted in the provisions of liberty. But these counterparts of the word of our Savior are tens of thousands in number, nor was it one or two only who sold their possessions and distributed them to the poor and needy. Indeed, we ourselves are witnesses that these were even such among men, and in the effects themselves we have seen the righteousness of the doctrine of our Savior. And what need can there be that we should say how many myriads, even of the barbarians themselves, have not of these only, but also of the Greeks, have, by the doctrine of the words of our Savior, been raised above every error of a plurality of gods, and have recognized and confessed that one only God, the Father and Creator of this whole world, him, I say, whom one Plato formerly knew, but confessed that he durst not speak of him before all men, because such power as all this of God's worship was not with him. But to these, the disciples of our Savior, it was, through the help of their Lord, easy to acknowledge him, and to find him at hand as the Father and Creator of all. And to every race of men did they reveal him, and so preached the knowledge of him to all throughout the whole creation, that from their teaching there are even to this time among all nations tens of thousands of congregations, not only of men, but also of women, children, slaves, and villagers. All this then accrued to them from this philosopher, so that they were not wanting not only to make him known as the maker and creator of this whole world, but they also became his ambassadors in every place. Such were the victories of the common Savior of all. These, the deceptions of him who was thought to be a deceiver, while, behold, such alone were his disciples and acquaintances, from whom it was but right we should learn of what sort their master was. Come then, let us again try the matter thus. You say of him that he was a magician, and not only so, but that he was a maker of magicians. You style him cunning and a deceiver. 
How then was it that he was the first and the only one who has arisen capable of this matter? Or is it not right we should according to custom ascribe the cause to the teachers? If then he was the first and only one capable of this, no one having taught him, and he having never learned anything from others, nor yet derived it from the ancients, how is it not then incumbent on us to confess of him that his nature was divine? He, I say, who without book, without precepts, and without teachers, so learned of himself, and was seen to know from himself the maker of all these things, when, observe, it is impossible for anyone to acquire a knowledge of the art of the goldsmith, of logic, or of the primitive elements of the world, without someone to instruct and teach him. But if he was out of nature, and no one ever so taught of himself, came out of a teacher of grammar, or of rhetoric, not having previously been taught, nor has there been a physician, or a builder, or practitioner of any other art, these things being but small and belonging to men, but this, one might say, is of the teacher of the whole habitable world, that he performed the miracles recorded in the scriptures, and whose disciples taught by himself were such, having received nothing from the ancients, neither having had any help from those moderns, who performed things not unlike what others had done who had preceded him. What other thing can we testify or confess but that the matter is in truth divine, and such as exceeds all human nature? But you say of him that he had deceiving teachers, and that neither the sciences of the Egyptians nor those mysteries which were formerly preached among them escaped him that from these he collected together his doctrines, and that he seems to have been a man of this description. If then others, his superiors, appeared before him, and were his teachers, whether in Egypt or elsewhere, why did not the fame of these also run forth prior to his name among all men, just as his has done? And why is not the praise of them also proclaimed even to this time, just as his has been? And... Who is the magician of those who arose at any time, barbarian or Greek, who was the teacher of such disciplines, the originator of all such laws and precepts as these are, and has showed forth the power of this, the common savior of all? And of whom has it ever been written that he did such cures as those which have been recorded of our savior? The knowledge, too, of something to come to pass with all those predictions, those two which, like these, have by their means been laid down as principles, what other has either before or after him been memorialized as having delivered? And who is it that has promised that he would affect those things throughout the whole habitable world which he had so predicted, and has, in fact, so confirmed his words that even to these our times the fulfillment of his predictions is visible to our own eyes, and whose disciples and eyewitnesses of the things themselves here had in view have ever so sealed the truth regarding those which they attested of their Lord by the trial of both fire and sword, as these disciples of our Savior have done, who indeed bore the reproach of all men for the sake of the thing which they had seen and witnessed of him, and submitted to every species of torment, while the end of their testimony respecting him was as that of the Son of God. How much less would magicians seal with their blood their testimonies, and which of the magicians, even if it had ever come into his mind to set up new people in his own name, did not only think of doing this, but also gave effect to his project? How would not this eclipse all human nature, that he should also frame laws opposed to the error of a plurality of gods, and adverse to the ordinances of kings, legislators, philosophers, poets, and theologians, and that he should send these forth and show through the period of a long life that they were at once triumphant and faultless? Which of the magicians is it who ever projected that which our Savior did? But if one did so project, Still he dared not to advance this, but if one so dared, still he brought not the matter to effect. He, the Savior, said in one word and announcement to his disciples, Go and make disciples of all nations in my name, and teach ye them everything that I have commanded you. 
and the deed he made to follow the word, for thence every race of the Greeks and barbarians became at once, and in a short space of time, his disciples. The laws, too, of our Savior were not written in any book of his, but without book were disseminated at his command among all nations, and these were opposed to the ancient worship of a plurality of gods, laws at enmity with demons, and unfriendly to every error of a multitude of deities, laws purifying the Scythians and the Persians and other barbarians, and converting them from every savage and lawless sort of life, laws subversive of the customs which had obtained from ancient times among the Greeks, and teaching the new and genuine worship of God. How then have they dared so to advance such things as these, that one should say of him that he was probably aided in this magic by others, the ancient magicians who were before his times? But if there was no other person whom anyone could say resembled him, neither was there consequently who could have been the cause of his possessing all this superiority. It is now time, therefore, that we should confess that an extraordinary and divine nature came into the world, which first and alone performed the things which had never before been commemorated among men. Let us again ask after these things, whether anyone ever saw with his eyes or learned by hearing that there were magicians such as he was, and composers of magical drugs who without libations sacrifices and invocations of demons performed the rites of magic when behold it is well known and clear to everyone that the whole process of magic is usually affected by these things for how can anyone bring an accusation of this sort either against our savior or against his disciples or against those who are even to these times led by his doctrine is there a man who can bring such an accusation as this against them is it not evident even to the blind that we are prepared for everything the reverse of these things, and that we dare to surrender up ourselves to death in an instant, and that we will not sacrifice to demons, that we instantly submit to be put out of life, but do not submit to be subjected to demons? And who is he who knows not how delightful it is to us that, through the name of our Savior, coupled with prayers that are pure, we cast out every kind of demon, and thus the word of our Savior, and the doctrine which is from him, have made us all to be greatly superior to the power which is invisible and impervious to inquiry, and such that we are ready to be enemies and haters of the demons. But not that we should be friends or followers of their customs, much less be subjected and obedient to them. How then could he have been a slave to the demons who delivered such things as these, to those who were devoted to himself? And how could he have sacrificed to evil spirits, or how could he have called upon the demons as his assistants and helpers, when all the demons and impure spirits have been agitated, as by some torment or punishment, even to this very time, at the mention of his name, and have departed and fled before his power, as it was in the case in former times, when he conversed with men, when they could not bear to see him, and one another crying out from another place and saying, what have we to do with thee, thou son of God? Art thou come to torment us before the time? Now, is not the man whose mind is intent on magic only, and is wholly addicted to things thus base in his character, openly odious, vile, corrupt, iniquitous, ungodly, and impious? And being such, whence and how can he teach others, either the things which pertain to the worship of God, or which respect purity, or which concern the knowledge of God, or which are on the immortality of the soul, or which inculcate righteousness and the judgment of God who is over all? Would he not be an ambassador of the things which are opposed to all these, persevering in those that attend on hatred and the denial of God, and the rooting up as fabulous the doctrine of a general providence of God, and laughing at the words which treat of virtue and affirm of the soul that is immortal? If indeed such things as these had been witnessed of him, then would there have been nothing, even respecting this our teacher, which could have been said to the contrary. But 
If in all his words and his deeds he was seen to call upon God who is over all and king of all, and prepared his disciples to be such, and if he was himself temperate and a teacher of temperance, if too he was a doer and a preacher of righteousness, of truth, of mercy, and of every virtue, and if he showed forth the worship of God, the king of all, how does it indeed not follow upon these things that we should think of him that not one of those wonderful acts which he did was done by magic and confess that it was in truth by the unseen power of God? These things then are directed against those who dare with ungodly mouths to blaspheme against him. But if they change and confess of him that he was a teacher of purity and sobriety of life and a bringer in of the doctrine of the true worship of God, still that he was no doer of those wonderful and powerful miraculous works which are recorded of him or of those divine deeds which are superior to man and that his disciples have fabricated these same, it is now time that we should also meet this accusation against those who do not believe the testimony of the disciples of our Savior respecting his miraculous deeds. If then these should say of him that he wrought no complete miracle, nor yet any of those wonderful works of which his disciples bore testimony, but that his disciples have otherwise falsely stated them, and have lied for the purpose of putting forth miraculous relations about him, let us see whether the word of these things is to be taken as satisfactory. There being no earthly cause that they can assign, why they, the disciples, and he, their master, went forth into the world. For he who teaches gives a promise of some doctrine, and they again, the disciples, love both the precepts and doctrines, as if conveying some valuable art, and give themselves up accordingly to the teacher. What ground, therefore, can there be for anyone to speak against the disciples of our Savior on account of their conversation with him? And what could have pressed them to this care respecting him, and that they should have recorded him as the teacher of such doctrines to themselves? Or is not this clear? For the things which they learned of him, they also declared fully to others, and these were the appointments of this his philosophy. They were, too, the first ambassadors of God who is over all, of the providence of God, of the righteous judgment of God, of the soul's being immortal, of the distinction between the life of the good and the bad, and of other things of this kind which are written in their scripture. It was also a precept pertaining to the life of this philosophy which he laid down for them when he said, Possess ye neither gold nor silver in your purses, neither scrip for the way, with other similar things, but his great precept was that they should give up their souls only to the providential care of the governor of all and not be anxious on account of want. And he so instructed them that they should consider his precepts much better than those which Moses delivered to the Jews. For he laid down a law for them as for men to whom murder would be easy that they should not kill and in like manner that they should not commit adultery as to men desolate and adulterous, and again, that they should not steal, as to men to whom slavery would be suitable, and that they should not injure, as to men who were fraudulent. But of these, he knew that it was desirable that they should stand in need of no such laws, but that this should above all things be precious in their sight, that their soul should be subject to no evil passion, and that they should root up and expel from the bottom of their heart, as from its root, the germ of every vice, and that they should be superior to wrath and every base desire, that is to say, that they should not even be angry, because of the superiority of their soul as being free from passion, that they should not look upon a woman with evil desire, that they should so labor against theft, that they should give of their own to them that needed, and further, that they should not glory in this, that they injured none, but rather in this, that those who wished to injure them they bore with without anger. But what need is there that I should collect together all the things which he and they taught? He also counseled them together with all these things, that they should be so confirmed in the truth as not to be under the necessity of giving even a true oath, much less a false one, but that they should so form their character that in it, apart from every sort of oath, they should appear as true and should proceed no farther than 
yea, and should in their conversation truly apply this. We may ask, therefore, whether there is anything, whatever it might be, against those who were the hearers of these things, and who forthwith arose as teachers of them to other disciples, out of which we may suppose they fabricated all the things which they attest that their master had done. And what is there in this leading us to suppose that they all thoroughly lied? They were in number the twelve who had been chosen, and the remaining seventy, of whom it is said that he sent them before him, two and two, even every place and part to which he was about to go. But there is not so much as a word that can be said of this whole company, showing that they belied him, of men who loved the life that was pure, and the worship of the true God, who cared but little for all the children of their own families, and who instead of their friends... Their wives, I say, their children, and all belonging to them, took to the life which had no possessions, and fully gave their testimony to their Lord, as from one mouth among all mankind. This is therefore the leading primary and true reason. Let us then also investigate that which is opposed to it. Let him therefore be considered the teacher, and them the disciples. And so, as it were, in a relation of hypothesis, that he taught none of the things already mentioned, but those opposed to them, that they should forthwith be transgressors of the law, should act impiously, iniquitously, fraudulently, and falsely, and should swear falsely, and do many hateful things, and if there be any other vice that can be named. Now, all these things are f wholly foreign to the doctrines of our Savior. They are opposed to them who would be the offspring of arrogance and impudence, nor are they only opposed to his words and doctrines, but also to the mode of life which has hitherto been delivered to all nations, that which is practiced in all his churches? But even if the matter be wholly false, then cannot its like be advanced that we should have been a race so negligent as not to have examined the things now before us? Let him then be supposed to have been the teacher of every vice and iniquity, and that the chief care was that they should, after all these things, remain concealed, and such custom is most wisely concealed under the form of a doctrine which is pure, and putting forth a new mode of worship. These then were led by such things, and by others still worse, for vice previously ensnares, and it constitutes the teaching of itself. They would then exalt their master to a state of greatness by lying words, and spare not even one expression of falsehood, and falsely ascribe to him every sort of miracle and wonderful work, that men might wonder at them and felicitate them, that they were dignified by being the disciples of such a master. Come then, let us now see if they really were such, whether it was possible that they could have been established, which they endeavored to do for him. For they say that, Evil is friendly to evil, but not to good. Whence, then, is this agreement in vice to be discovered in the multitudes of all these men? And whence this testimony respecting them, that the object of them all was in unison? And whence this doctrine about the divine appointments and the teaching of the true philosophy? Whence also the mind intent on the life of virtue? Also, whence the doctrine inculcating flight from every vice? Whence also the knowledge and recording of precepts such as these, and whence the glory of the conduct and conversation which was delivered by them throughout the whole creation of man, whence too all this power, whence this courage, whence this confidence, whence this resignation even to death. But who would at first, even in opinion, have had respect to the man who taught vice and bitterness, as it is here said of him, and who promised such things, they would surely say such were the deeds of a magician, but the disciples of this leader were in nothing vicious, and must not they have understood these things at the end of their master, and what sort of death he was affected? Why then, after such an end of shame, did they continue in these things, and affirm of him, who was then among the dead, that he was God? unless they thought it a thing of no moment, that they themselves should suffer similar things. Now, who is it that has voluntarily and openly ever chosen punishment for the sake of nothing profitable? For had they been desirous of possessions, so would they also of profit, and if they had been abominable in character, 
they would have been lustful, we may then think of them perhaps, that they had thus dealt with the matter for the sake of these things, and intrepidly exposed themselves even to death. But if they preached what was adverse to these, and fully proclaimed it in the hearing of all congregations of Christians, also immediately instructed men in the doctrines of the scriptures, that they should flee from every vicious and base desire, and should avoid everything fraudulent, and should overcome every sort of lust, and the love of money, and that they did moreover so teach those who became their disciples, it will be likely they carried on no merchandise, collected no wealth, and took no part in a life either of ease or of pleasure. Since, therefore, they were led by none of these things, how could they have been induced to suffer for no object, the worst of punishments and of vengeance for the testimony given of their master, which again had no foundation in fact? But let it be granted that they honored him while he was yet with them, and had his conversation among them, and led them astray by deception, as it has been affirmed. How was it then that even after his death, and then much more strenuously than before, they went on calling him God? Because while he was yet among them, it is said they even forsook and denied him, and at the time when his deceivers were ready to take him, but after his departure from among men, they joyfully chose death, rather than relinquish the good testimony they had given respecting him. Those disciples, therefore, who formerly knew no good thing of their master, neither the life, deed, doctrine, nor work that was worthy of praise, and who had received no advantage from him, except indeed vice and the leading astray of men, how was it that they so easily gave themselves up to death, not because they were in any respect guilty, but because they had attested things so glorious and praiseworthy of him? when, behold, it was improper of every one of them to live in safety and to lead a life of comfort at home with his friends. But how could men, who were themselves deceived and deceiving, submit willingly to death for another, who, as they knew with certainty and better than all others, had not been in any one thing a cause of good to them, but, as men say, the teacher of every evil? A man, endued with mind and virtue, may indeed, for some noble conquest, or for some excellent person, occasionally, with propriety and even with glory, submit to death. But he who is so base in character as to have been in pursuit only of the things of a temporal life, and the enjoyment of lusts, has never chosen death rather than life, nor has suffered severe punishment for the sake of his friends, much less for one convicted of vice. How, then, could the disciples of the person mentioned, who could not have been ignorant that he was a deceiver and magician, if he really had been such, or even retaining in themselves every vice that was hateful, have willingly undergone every species of torment and of punishment from their countrymen, on account of the testimony they had given of him. But this is by no means the disposition of the vicious, for I myself have seen many, who have faithfully kept society and oath with the living, who but as soon as these died, dissolved every compact of this sort entered into between them. And we all know accurately how the sophists, brought together in the cities generally, and in glorious repute for their erudition and display of words, load with praises the governors, and those vested with great power and rule, just so long as they retain this, but as soon as any change in this respect happens to them, these also change their words, and no more will they willingly memorialize those whom they formerly did, purely from the fear of those now in power. If, then, these disciples of our Savior were deceived and deceiving, I would add this also, they were unlearned and altogether illiterate. That is, they were even barbarians, and understood no language except Syriac. How, then, did they, after the departure of their Lord from among men, go forth into the whole creation and give their testimony to his Godhead. And by what sort of advice were they prevailed on to attempt this? By what power, too, did they effect that which they undertook? It might have happened, indeed, that some rustics at their own homes would be perverted and led astray, but that they, the disciples, should be sent forth into foreign countries that should not relinquish their object through remissness, and should preach the name of our Savior to every man, together with his deeds of wonder, and not this only, but should also teach his commandments both in the villages and cities, some of them to the Roman power itself, 
and some apportioned to themselves this city of the empire, and others to the Persians, and others to those among the Armenians, others to the nations of Parthians, and again to that also of the Scythians, that some of these should go forth even as far as the extremities of the creation, and arrive at the country of the Hindus, others pass over to the islands beyond the ocean, and which are called Britain, could not, I think, have been the things of men, how much less of those who were deficient and illiterate, how much still less of deceivers and magicians. How then could those, whose experience of their master was that he was vicious and a perverter, and who had with their own eyes witnessed his departure by death, have used such terms with each other, for this, thus they should unanimously lie respecting him? For they all attested as with one mouth the cleansing of lepers, the casting out of demons, the raising of the dead, the restoring sight to the blind, and many other instances of cure which were effected by him. And after these things, his resurrection after the death which they had previously witnessed, for to such things not happening nor even being heard of in their times, how could they with one mouth have given testimony and convinced themselves that they came to pass, and have continued to place faith in this their testimony, even to death? Was it either that they were brought together, and that they swore to do this, and that they entered into compact with one another, to fabricate and falsely to put forth things which never came to pass? And shall we say that they used terms to this effect as the pretense for such a compact, or such as these, men, our friends, him who was, as it were, yesterday or the day before, a deceiver and a teacher of error, who suffered extreme punishment before the eyes of us all? We know better and more accurately than any other how far he excelled, because we were the disciples of his secret mysteries. He appeared as pure to the many, and thought that he possessed something better than the many, but he possessed nothing great, nor yet anything worthy of that his resurrection, unless one might say that he was cunning and impure in character, and that those were perversions which he taught us, and the false boastings which was favorable to such things. Come, let us give the right hand to one another, and let us all at once enter into compact among ourselves, that we will unanimously put forth among all mankind falsehood respecting him, and will say that we saw him give sight to the blind, a thing which not one of us have ever heard of, and that he cleansed the lepers and raised the dead. And we will in a body affirm that things were done by him which we indeed never saw, and were said by him which we likewise never heard. Those things too which were done, as it were in reality, we will contend for as such. And if this his last end has been published, and he so openly received his death that no one can conceal it, we will nonetheless impudently make this of no effect, attesting perniciously that he rose from the dead, and also with all of us, and accompanied us both in conversation and in usual meals, and let this then be pertinaciously and shamelessly retained in all these things so remain with us that we persist in it even to death." For why might we not expose ourselves to death for nothing? And why should it molest us willingly to receive stripes and torments in our persons for nothing that is necessary? And if it be required that we should suffer imprisonment, injury, and affliction for nothing that is true, should submit instantaneously to this, should all of us together lie by consent, and put forth falsehood for no profit whatsoever, either to ourselves or to those who may be deceived by us, or to him, of, to, of whom these lies have been told by us, affirming that he was God, and that we should extend this falsehood not only to our own people, but should also go out among all mankind and fill the whole creation with the things we have thus laid down respecting him, and should thence proceed forthwith to make laws for all nations subversive of the opinions respecting the gods of their forefathers, those, I say, which had from ancient times been established among them, and that we should first of all lay our commands upon 
the Romans, not to worship those whom their forefathers supposed to be gods, that we should also then pass off to the Greeks and preach that which is also adverse to their wise men, that we should not neglect the Egyptians, but contend also with their deities, but should not draw out against them to the things of Moses, which were in former times adverse to them, but place against them the death of our teachers as something terrific, and should destroy that fame respecting the gods, which formerly went out from among them to all mankind, not by mere words and stories, but by the power of our Lord, of him who was crucified, and that we should again proceed even to the extremities of the land of the barbarians and subvert the things prevailing with all men. And for this purpose, not one of us should be wanting. For the reward pertaining to the things which we so attempted would not be small, since the triumphs to which we should present ourselves would not be simple ones, but as is likely would be punishments awarded by the laws of every place, open bonds, torments, imprisonments, fire, sword, death by the cross, and by wild beasts. But because we would acquire a likeness to our teacher, we would willingly rather, and with joyfulness, one and all continue partaking in these calamities. For what can there be better than this, that we should be found enemies to both God and man, for no one thing profitable, and also that we should obtain nothing of ease. Neither should see our friends, nor in any way increase our wealth, nor even possess the hope of any good to perfection, but should, on the contrary, vainly and without any object, err ourselves, and lead others also astray. For this is the helpful thing, had in view that we should both be opposed to all nations, and also engaged in contention with those gods whom all men have from ancient times confessed, and that we should preach of him who was our teacher, and who died before our eyes, that he was God and the Son of God, and that we ourselves should be ready to die for him, having learned from him nothing true and nothing advantageous, and that we should particularly honor him because he aided us in nothing excellent, and should moreover do everything in order to glorify his name, suffer every sort of injury and vengeance, and willingly receive every form of punishment for nothing that is true. For evil certainly is truth, and falsehood has that which is opposed to vice. On this account we say that he even raised the dead, and also cleansed the lepers, and also cast out demons, and was the doer of other wonderful works when we know of no such things done by him, but have fabricated all these things for ourselves, and thus led all astray, on whom we could prevail to do so. But if any one would not be so persuaded, still we ourselves should, for the sake of the things which we had so bargained upon among ourselves, have brought forth upon ourselves the things worthy of such a system of error. And do these things appear to you as convincing? And can you so far persuade yourself that they, his disciples, did falsely put forth such things as these, and that men so deficient and unlettered did actually make such compact among themselves and triumphantly walk over the power of the Romans? Can human nature, possessed as it is with the love of life, have ever submitted for no object and of its own will to death? Or could the disciples of our Savior have been carried on to such an excess of madness that they should at once, when they had seen no act of a miraculous character performed by him, have falsely put forth by compact such things as these? And could they have put together such lying statements respecting him and then have readily submitted to death in support of them? But they went not forth by compact to this work of preaching respecting him, nor did they make any compact among themselves. Whence then had they this perfect agreement of testimony respecting his deeds? Is it not likely from seeing the things which were done by him? For one of these two things must be the fact. That is, either they made compact among themselves and lied, or else they attested what they had seen with their eyes. If then they really saw the things and preached them to all men, they were worthy of credit when they said of our Savior that he was God, and that he permitted them to see with their eyes the permitting forth of divine powers, miracles, and wonderful works. 
If, however, they really saw none of these things, so record it, but put together false statements, and accordingly made oath and sworn covenant on this, that is, that they would say nothing true, and then lied, and attested of their Lord what was false, how could they in reality have submitted to death for nothing true? And that neither fire, nor sword, nor fierce beasts, nor the depth of the sea could make them falsify the accounts which they had thus falsely put forth respecting their Lord. But how can you say that they neither expected nor hoped that they should suffer any calamity from this their testimony respecting him, and that they therefore went out even boldly to the work of preaching about him, on the contrary, it was impossible that they should not have hoped that they should suffer every sort of calamity, superinducing as they did the destruction of the gods at once of the Romans, the Greeks, and the barbarians. Now, the book itself, which speaks of them, shows plainly that after the death of their lord, certain men, enemies of the word, and who lay in wait for it, laid hands on them, delivering them first to imprisonment, and then strictly commanding them that they should speak to none in the name of Jesus. And when they found them afterwards openly teaching the multitudes the things respecting him, they violently seized and scourged them, and forbade them so to teach. Simon Peter, answering, said to them, It is right that we should rather hearken to God and not to men. After these things, too, Stephen was stoned with stones and died, because he had openly spoken of him in the assembly of the Jews. And there arose no small persecution against those who were the ambassadors of the name of Jesus. And again, at another time, when Herod, the king of the Jews, slew James, the brother of John, with the sword, he the same confined Simon Peter in bonds, as it is written in the Acts of the Apostles. And while these suffered such things, the rest of the disciples persevered, grew strong, and remained in the doctrine of our Savior, and again preached to all men, more particularly respecting him and his wonderful works. After these things, James whom those who formerly resided at Jerusalem called the just, on account of his great excellence, was interrogated of the chief priests and doctors of the Jewish people as to what he thought of Jesus, and when he returned answered to them that he was the Son of God. He was also stoned with stones by them. Simon Peter, too, was, in the manner of Christ, crucified at Rome. Paul also was slain, and John was committed to the island of Patmos in banishment. And while these suffered such things, not so much as one of the rest forsook his Christ's doctrine. And indeed, all of them prayed that such things might befall them, in order that they might, for the sake of the worship of God, be like to those already mentioned. And on this account again, they openly gave their testimony of our Savior and of his wonderful works the more abundantly. And observe, if the things which they preached respecting him were lies and they had fabricated them by compact, we ought to wonder how this whole company could have observed this agreement, and what they had fabricated even to death, and no one of them ever betrayed any fear on account of the things that had happened to those who had previously been slain, or left their society, or preached that which opposed what his companion had, or brought to light the things that they had agreed upon, or even he who filled with the love of money, dared to deliver him up to his enemies, did forthwith and with his own hands inflict punishment on himself. Now, is it not this replete with wonder that men who were deceivers and unlettered, knowing neither how to speak or understand any language beyond that of their fathers, should not only undertake to go forth and to pass into all nations, but should also go forth and effect their purpose? And let this also be considered that not even one of them ever uttered a word adverse to the marvelous deeds of their Lord. If then the agreement of witnesses is sufficient to settle any of these things about which there is doubt, and which is commonly brought into dispute in the courts of law, and the law of God is declared that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every matter shall be established, shall not the truth also be established by these who were the chosen twelve and the disciples seventy in number, and thousands others besides these, all of whom at once exhibited so wonderful an agreement, and who have so given their testimony to the things done by our Savior? 
This too they did, not without affliction, but in the suffering of torments, and of every species of injury, of scourgings, imprisonment, and deaths. On this account they were, through God, believed, in order that he might everywhere confirm the word preached by their means throughout the whole habitable world, even to this day. Let it be considered, then, that we have granted these things, by connivance, at an unjust principle, for in this that a man might imagine that which is adverse to the scripture, and that we should say of the common Saviour of all that he was a teacher, not of righteous precepts, but of those of vice, fraud, and of every sort of abomination, and that these his disciples learned the same from him, and were all lustful and vicious in everything beyond all men that ever existed. We allowed by connivance, according to the statement, supposed that which is of all things the most improper, for this would be, as if one should in a similar manner injuriously accuse Moses, who said in the law, Thou shalt not kill, neither shalt thou commit adultery, neither shalt thou steal, neither shalt thou bear false witness, and should say that he uttered these things by way of irony and in hypocrisy, for it was his wish nevertheless that his hearers should kill, commit adultery, and act in direct opposition to the things which he himself showed in the law laid down, and put forth merely the form of an approach to purity of life. But there is nothing so shameless as this. In like manner also might any one arraign the positions of the philosophers among the Greeks, whose lives were those of patience, as were all their words, and might say that they were in their conduct opposed to what they wrote, and so showed themselves to have made a mere hypocritical approach to the life which belongs to philosophy. And thus we affirm, might any one simply arraign all the writings of the ancients, and show cause against the truth which they contain, and might himself receive that which is diametrically opposed to these. But as it cannot be difficult to any one possessed of common sense to pronounce of this that it would be madness, so also of the precepts of our Saviour and of his disciples should any one pervert the truth which is found in these, and attempt to fix upon him the things diametrically opposed to his teaching. But let that be granted which the statement itself requires. How much more will it then appear that the assertion of the opponent cannot stand as being grounded in a connivance and concession which it is improper to allow. These things being then refuted, let us also consider the testimony of the scriptures of the divinity and the spotless and truth-loving manner of the disciples of our Savior. Any one, therefore, who chooses to exercise a sound mind may hence see that they were worthy of all dignity since they confessed that they were mean and unlettered in their discourse, and betook themselves to a love for the doctrine of the worship of God and of philosophy. They also desired the life capable of submitting to sufferings, and afflicted by fasting, by abstinence from wine and from flesh, and by many other humiliating things of the body, by prayer and supplication to God, and more particularly by temperance, and the chief holiness of the body and soul, and who is not astonished at this, that they should, for the sake of the excellency of wisdom, have even separated themselves from the wives that had been lawfully given to them, and that they were led by no natural desires, and subdued by no love of children, since they desired not the children that were mortal, but those which were immortal. And... How can any one fail to wonder at this their character, that they desired no money? Or how, imagine this, that they fled not from, but loved a teacher who despised the possessions of gold and silver, and the lawgiver who laid it down, that they should not enlarge their possessions even to two coats, which any one hearing would doubtless seek excuse from its severe requirements, while they were seen to act upon it even to the letter for upon a certain occasion a lame man, one of whom was begged on account of the extreme doubt as to provision, asked alms of those who were about Simon Peter. And when Simon Peter had nothing he could give, he confessed that he was destitute of every sort of possession of silver and gold. 
and said, Silver and gold have I none. After this he brought forth the precious name, which is, of all things, the most precious, and said, This which I have I give thee, in the name of Jesus the Christ, arise and walk. And when they attended to their teacher, Jesus enjoined upon them the grievous things which should happen to them in these words, which he said to them, In the world ye shall have tribulation, and again ye shall weep and mourn, but the world shall rejoice. How plainly did the firmness and deep sincerity of their character not appear, since they fled not from these severe exercises of the soul, nor betook themselves to the things of the desires, nor did their Lord, moreover, allure them by way of deception, or make them his by promising them the things which supply ease and comfort, but truly and freely foretold to those them which should happen to them, and enabled them to choose for themselves the sort of conduct which he had laid down for them. Of this sort were the things which he foretold and attested respecting the persecutions that were to happen to them because of his name, that is, that they should come before governors and even kings, and that they should suffer every sort of punishment and vengeance, not on account of anything hateful, nor for any other cause, but for this only, that is, for their testimony respecting him, which indeed we have seen with our own eyes, has happened even to this time. His prediction, moreover, is worthy of our admiration, for the testimony given respecting the name of our Savior and the confessing of him had usually the effect of inflaming the anger of the rulers, and even if nothing hateful had been perpetrated by any one confessing Christ, they punished and injuriously treated him on account of his name as evil and more evil than any other things. But if any one did not confess his name, but denied that he was a disciple of Christ, he was immediately set at liberty, even if he were implicated in many things which were abominable. But what necessity can there be that I should collect and endeavor to record? The many things relating to the lives of the disciples of our Savior, when the things already advanced, will be sufficient proof of all that is before us. To these, however, we will again add the things following, here in their place, and with these we will conclude our discussion. As to Matthew the Apostle, his former manner of life was not that which was excellent. On the contrary, he was one of those whose business was tax-gathering and fraud. However, not one of the rest of the apostles has laid open to us, neither John the Apostle who was with him, nor Luke, nor Mark, the writers of the rest of the Gospels, but Matthew, recording his own manner of life, has become his own accuser. Hear then how openly he has memorialized his own name against himself in his own writing. He has thus spoken. And when Jesus passed from thence, he saw a man sitting among the tax gatherers, whose name was Matthew. And he said to him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass that when he was sitting in the house, behold, many tax gatherers and sinners were sitting with Jesus and with his disciples. And again after these things, when passing away and reciting the number of the rest of the disciples, he added, respecting himself, the name of tax-gatherer, and spoke thus, The names of the twelve apostles are these, the first Simon, who is called Cephas, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, and Thomas and Matthew the tax-gatherer. Thus therefore Matthew evinces, through the greatness of his humility, his truth-loving character calls himself a tax-gatherer, conceals not his former mode of life, and counts himself among sinners. He also numbers himself second to the apostle who was with him, for he associated himself with Thomas, as he did Simon with Andrew, James with John, and Philip with Bartholomew, placing Thomas first and honoring him as the more excellent apostle with himself, while the rest of the evangelists have done the reverse of this. Hear therefore how Luke bears the record of Matthew not giving him the appellation of tax-gatherer, nor placing him after Thomas, but because he considered him the more worthy, numbering him first and placing Thomas after him, just as Mark has done, his words then are these. And when it was day, he called his disciples and chose twelve out of them, 
those who he named apostles, Simon, whom he named Cephas, and Andrew, his brother, James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas. Thus, therefore, Luke honored Matthew, just as they, who had from the first been eyewitnesses and hearers of the word, had delivered to him. And thus Matthew, through his humility, made little of himself, confessed that he was a tax-gatherer, and numbered himself the second in order, after the apostle who was named with him. You will also find that John is like Matthew in this respect, for in his epistle he does not so much as make mention of himself, or call himself elder, or apostle, or evangelist. In the gospel, too, which was written by him, he says of himself that Jesus loved him, but he does not reveal his own name. Simon Peter, moreover, did not so much as attempt the writing of a gospel, on attempt of his great fear of responsibility, but Mark, they say, who being well known to him and his disciple, put on record the declarations of Simon respecting the deeds of our Savior, who when he betook himself to the recording of these things, when Jesus asked what men said of him, and the disciples themselves what they thought of him, Simon answered and said to him, Thou art the Christ made the statement that Jesus did not even answer him or say anything to him, but that he forbade their telling this to any man. Now Mark committed these things to writing, although he was not present with Jesus when he said them, but he had heard them from Peter when he taught them. Peter, however, was unwilling to state the things which Jesus had said either to him or about him by way of testimony favorable to himself. But the things which were said of him are these, which Matthew has put forth in these words. But you, whom say ye that I am, Simon said to him, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed art thou, Simon, son of Jonas, since flesh and blood have not revealed this to thee, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church, and the gate bars of hell shall not prevail against it. And I give to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and every one whom thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and every one whom thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. When therefore all these things were said to Simon Peter by Jesus, Mark did not record so much as one of them, because, as it is probable, neither did Peter mention them in his teaching. These things therefore Simon Peter well kept silent, and thence Mark omitted them. But the things of his denial of Christ he preached to all men, and so caused an accusation to be recorded against himself. And he wept bitterly too. Over this you will find Mark too have given the record in these words. And when Peter was in the court, one of the maid servants of the high priest came to him, and when she saw that he was warming himself, she looked upon him and said to him, Thou also wast with Jesus the Nazarene. But he denied and said, I know him not, nor do I perceive what thou sayest. And he went out into the outer court and the cock crew. And again a maid saw him, and began to say to those who were standing by, This man also was one of them. And he again denied, and again a little after, those who were standing by said to Simon, Truly thou art one of them, for thou art also a Galilean. But he also began to curse, and to say, I know not this man of whom ye speak. And immediately the cock crew the second time. These things Mark wrote, and these Simon Peter witness against himself. For all these things of Mark are, they say, the memorials of the declarations of Peter himself. Of those, therefore, who excuse themselves from saying the things which would contribute to their own good fame, and who recorded against themselves accusations which can never be forgotten, charging themselves with their own foolishness in things which none of those who came afterwards could have known, had they not been recorded by themselves, how shall we not assert that they were free from every feeling of self-love and lying statement, and justly confess of them that they openly and clearly put forth the proof of an ardent love of truth? Those, therefore, who evince such a character as this, of whom men thought that they were the authors of falsehood and of lying, and whom they endeavored to malign as deceivers, how are these not now found to be a laughing stock? lovers of hatred and envy and enemies to the truth. For how should not those be such who insisted on the things which were guileless and of no hateful observance? These same, I say, whose characters were true and pure and who showed forth their habitual dispositions by their words, 
not that men should say of them that they were cunning and wily sophists and fabricators of things that had no existence, and laid upon their lord, by way of favor, things which he never did. It does appear to me that we may well put the questions to these, whether it be right we should give credence to the disciples of our Savior or not. And if we are not to give credence to these only, whether we should to all those also who have long ago preached the memorial of their conduct and precepts, both among the Greeks and the barbarians, and have committed to writing time after time the victories attending this, and also whether it be just to extend credence to others, but to withhold it from them only, how clearly then does not the malice of such opponents appear? But why should these have lied respecting their Lord, and have delivered down in their writings things of him which had no existence, as if they had really happened? Why, too, should they have falsely stated of him the sufferings, and of other grievous things which he bore, his betrayal by one word of his disciple Judas, the accusation of those who criminated him, the ridicule, the contempt of the judgment passed on him, the reproach, the smitings on the face, the scourges laid upon his loins, the crown of thorns which was placed upon him in reproach, the purple robe which they put upon him after the manner of a cloak, and at last the bearing of his cross, the signal mark of his victory, that he was then affixed to this, that he was pierced both in his hands and feet, that they gave him vinegar to drink, that one struck him on the head with a reed, that he was derided of those who looked upon him, is it right, I say, that we should suppose his disciples to have falsely stated even these and many other similar things that are written about him, or that we should believe they truly stated these disreputable things, but that we should not give credence to those which are honorable to him? But how can this system of contrariety be supported? For this, that men should affirm that these same persons were true, and again, that they were false, would be nothing else but to affirm of them that which is in itself contradictory, of what sort then should the reprehension of these be? For if this stigma is to be fixed upon them, that is, they propagated falsehood and exalted their Lord by lying statements, and adorned him by means of fabricated miracles, they surely never would have committed to writing the things already mentioned, and which were adverse to themselves, nor would they have made it known to those who should have come afterwards that he, whose ambassadors they were, was oppressed and exceedingly sorrowful, and was perturbed in his soul, or that they forsook him and fled, or that he, who was the chosen of all the apostles, and his disciple, the same Simon Peter, I say, who was preached of, did, without either pain afflicted or torment threatened, deny him three times. For these things, even if said by others, it was necessary they should deny, they, I say, who betook themselves to nothing else except the fabrication of false statements favorable to him, and magnifying both themselves and their Lord. If then they appear to be lovers of truth in those grievous accounts which they give of him, much more are they so in those glorious ones. For those who choose to lie on in any one occasion would the more particularly avoid those things which brought difficulty with them, either by silence or denial of them. Because... Those who should come after would not have it in their power to blame the things which they had so kept silent. Why then did they not lie and say that Judas who betrayed him forthwith became a stone when he dared to give the kiss of the sign of betrayal, or that he who dared to strike him on the cheek had his right hand immediately withered, or the high priest of the Jews, because he ran along with those who criminated him, became blind in his eyes? Why did they not all lie, and say that in truth no grievance whatsoever happened to him, but that he concealed himself from men, and laughed at their judgment hall, and that those who accused him were deceived by specters sent from God, thinking that they were doing something adverse to one who was not near them? And why should not that this have been deemed more glorious than their falsely stating that he raised the dead, and was the doer of wonderful works? This that they should have recorded, that nothing either human or mortal happened to him, but that he did everything by divine power, that he made his ascension to heaven in the divine glory. For those who gave credence to their other accounts could not have withholden their belief from these. How then should those be deemed worthy of exception from every suspicion of vice, who concealed nothing of the truth, as to the difficulties and calamities so happening? 
and not also worthy of all credit as to the other miraculous deeds which they attested to respecting him. The testimony, therefore, of these men respecting our Savior is sufficient. There is, nevertheless, nothing to prohibit our availing ourselves, even the more abundantly, of the Hebrew witness Josephus, who in the eighteenth book of his Antiquities of the Jews, writing the things that belong to the times of Pilate, commemorates our Savior in these words. A Testimony of Josephus Respecting the Christ At this period, then, was Jesus a wise man, if it be right to call him a man, for he was the doer of wonderful works, and the teacher of those men who with pleasure received him in truth, and he brought together many both of the Jews and many of the profane Gentiles, and this was the Messiah Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal ancient men among ourselves, laid on him the punishment of the cross, those who formerly loved him were not reduced to silence, for he appeared again to them on the third day, alive, things which, with many others, the prophets had said respecting him, so that from thence, even until now, the race of the Christians has not been wanting to him. I therefore, as this author attests to him, he was the doer of wonderful works, and that he made his disciples not only the twelve apostles or the seventy disciples, but also attached to himself myriads of others, both of the Jews and Gentiles. It is clear that he possessed something excellent beyond the rest of mankind. For how could he have otherwise attached to himself the many, both of the Jews and Gentiles, unless he had made use of miracles and astonishing deeds and of doctrines till then unknown? The book of the Acts of the Apostles also attests that there were many thousands of the Jews who were persuaded that he was that Christ of God who had been preached of by the prophets. It is also on record that there was a great church of Christ at Jerusalem which had been collected from among the Jews even to the times of its reduction by Hadrian. The first bishops, too, who were there are said to have been, one after another, fifteen in number, who were Jews the names of whom are published to the men of that place even until now, so that by these every accusation against the disciples may be undone, since what was prior to them and independent of their testimony, these attest of him, that he, the Christ of God, did by means of these wonderful works which he performed reduce many, both of the Jews and of the Gentiles, beneath his power. You will also be made acquainted with the divinity of his power if you will consider of what nature he was, and how it was that all this superiority of the divine power operated in the overcoming of tilings exceeding all description. For let it be considered, no one who ever wished to disseminate his laws or any strange doctrine among all nations, and who would show himself to be a teacher of the worship of the one supreme God to all races of men, would be willing to make use of those as the ministers of his will who were of all men the most rustic and deficient. And it is likely, one might think, that he would attempt this with the greatest impropriety. For how could they who could scarcely open their lips ever be the teachers of any one man, much less the multitudes? And how could they, destitute of every sort of erudition, address whole assemblies, unless this were indeed a showing forth of the will of God? For he called them, as we have already shown, and said in the first place, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And because he thenceforth made them his own, and they adhered to him, he breathed into them the divine power, and filled them both with strength and courage. And... As he was the word of God in truth and the doer of all these miracles, he made them the fishermen of intellectual and reasonable souls, adding at once to the word, Follow me and I will make you the deed, making them both the doers and teachers of the worship of his God. And thus he sent them forth into all nations throughout the whole creation and demonstrated that they were the preachers of his doctrine. And who is not astonished and probably incredulous as to this miracle which could scarcely indeed have been imagined, since no one of those who have been imminent has ever been commemorated 
as having had recourse to any such thing as this, or has come up to anything resembling it, for it has been the desire of each one of these to set up something promising to himself and his own land only, or to be able to establish such laws as seem to him good among some one people of his own, but observe of him who availed himself of nothing, either human or mortal, how in reality he again put forth the word of God in the precept, which he gave to these his powerless disciples, Go ye and make disciples of all nations. It is likely, too, his disciples would thus address their Lord by way of answer, How can we do this? For how can we preach to the Romans? And how can we discourse with the Egyptians? What diction can we use against the Greeks, being brought up in the Syrian language only? How can we persuade the Persians, the Armenians, the Chaldeans, the Scythians, the Hindus, and other nations called barbarians to desert the gods of their forefathers and to worship the one creator of all things? And upon what superiority of words can we rely that we shall succeed in this? Or how can we hope that we shall prevail in these things attempted? What that we should legislate for all nation and direct opposition to the laws laid down from ancient times, and this against their gods? And what power have we upon which to trust that we shall succeed in this enterprise? These things, therefore, the disciples of our saviors would have either thought or said, but he who was their Lord solved by one additional word, the aggregate of the things of which they doubted, and pledged them by saying, ye shall conquer in my name. For it was not that he commanded them simply and indiscriminately to go and make disciples of all nations, but with this excellent addition which he delivered in my name, since it was by the power of his name that all this came to pass. As the apostle has said, God has given him a name which is superior to every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow which is in heaven and which is in earth, and which is beneath the earth. It is likely, therefore, that he would show forth the excellency of the unseen power which was hidden from the many by his name, and accordingly he made the addition in my name. He thus accurately foretold, moreover, something which should come to pass when he said, It is expedient that this my gospel be preached in the whole world for the testimony of all nations. Now this matter was then declared in a corner of the earth, so that those only who were at hand could have heard it. But how could they have believed him when he said this, unless they had taken experiment as to the truth of his words from the other divine acts which were done by him? For this you are compelled to confess when it is considered that they gave credence to what he said, for when he gave them the command, not so much as one sought to be excused, but they confided in what he had intimated, and just as his promises had been, so did they make disciples of this whole race of men. They did go forth from their own land into all nations, and in a short time his words were seen in effect. His gospel was therefore shortly preached throughout the whole creation for the testimony of all nations so that the barbarians and Greeks received the scriptures respecting the common savior of all and the handwriting of their progenitors and in the words of their spiritual fathers. A man might therefore well stand in doubt as to what the form of the doctrine of our savior's disciple was how they passed on in the midst of cities, and so proclaimed it in the middle of the streets, lifting up their voices, calling to those with whom they met, and thence conversing with the people, also of what sort the language was in which they addressed them, so that we can imagine the hearers were persuaded thereby, and again, how such men, inexperienced in words and far removed from every sort of erudition, could speak before the people, and this if not in large assemblies, still with the few with whom they met, and then addressed, and of what and of what sort of terms they made use for persuading their hearers. Nor was their effort small, since they by no means denied the ignominious death of him whom they preached. But even if they concealed this, and did not confess before all what and how many things he suffered of the Jews, 
but put forth only those splendid and glorious things, I say indeed, his wondrous works, his miraculous operations, and his doctrines of the true philosophy, still the matter will not thus be made easy how they could make those who heard them easily to give in to their declarations, because their diction would be foreign. They would too now be listening to declarations entirely new coming from men who possessed nothing worthy of truth and testimony of the things affirmed by them. But let it be supposed that the persuasiveness now put forth were these, that those who were his ambassadors should at one time preach that he was God, that in body he was human, and that in his nature he was no other than the Word of God, on which account also he performed all these miracles, and put forth these powers, but that at another time he suffered reproach and infamy, and at last the capital and shameful punishment of the cross, which is inflicted on those only who are in their deeds the worst of all men. Who then would not now properly treat them with ridicule, as affirming things opposed to each other? And who is he whose intellect would partake so much of stone as readily to believe them when they said that they saw him after his death, that he rose from the dead? Him, I say, who could not help himself when among the living, and among who would ever be persuaded by men so illiterate and deficient as these when saying, you should despise the things of your own forefathers, charge as folly those of the wise of ancient times, suffer yourselves to be persuaded by us alone, and to be commanded by the precepts of him who was crucified, for he only is the beloved and only begotten of that God alone who is over all. I myself, however, investigating for myself with effort and in the love of truth, the same thing, singly should perceive not one virtue in making it credible, nor even anything great or worthy of faith, nor so persuasive as adequate to the persuading of even one illiterate person, much less wise and intellectual, nevertheless, when again I view its power, and the result of its doings, how the many myriad have given their assent to it, and how churches of tens of thousands of men have been brought together by these very deficient and rustic persons, nor that these were built in obscure places, nor in those which are unknown, but rather in the greatest cities, I say in the imperial city of Rome itself, in Alexandria, in Antioch, and in all Egypt, in Libya, in Europe, in Asia, both in the villages and other places, and among all nations, I am again compelled to recur to the question of its cause, and to confess that they, the disciples, could not otherwise have undertaken this enterprise than by a divine power which exceeds that of man, and by the assistance of him who said to them, Go and make disciples of all nations in my name. And when he said this to them, he attached to it the promise by which they should be so encouraged as readily to give themselves up to the things commanded. For he said to them, Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. It is stated, moreover, that he breathed into them the Holy Ghost with the divine power, thus giving them the power to work miracles, saying at one time, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, and at another, commanding them to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. Freely ye have received, freely give. Even you yourself see, therefore, how this their word took effect, since even the book of their acts attest things like to these, and which accord with them how, for example, when writing also of those by whom miraculous deeds were done in the name of Jesus, those who were present and saw were astonished. They were astonished, as it should seem, at those who had formerly seen this power by means of deeds, and who then made them, the chief priest, readily to ask who this was, by whose power and name the miracle had been wrought, and thus, as they taught, they found that these had in faith even run before their instruction, for it was not by words that they were persuaded, but it was by the deeds which preceded these that they were readily prevailed upon to accede to these things. It is also said that men suddenly brought to them sacrifices and libation, as if they had been gods, thinking that one of them was Mercury, the other Jupiter, 
and the whole of this astonishment was to their minds a demonstration that the deeds done were miraculous. And as all those which they preached respecting our Savior, which, such as these, they were thenceforth quickly and with propriety received, nor did they give their testimony of his resurrection from the dead by mere words and without proofs, but by their power and by deeds did they persuade and show forth the works of the living God. If then they preached that he was God and the Son of God, and that he was with the Father before he came among men, why should they have not especially added to this that they believed what was at first to have been impossible and incredible? For they must have justly thought it impossible that these acts could have been those of men, but on the contrary, those of God, even the more, though no one would say this. And this, nothing else, is indeed the thing required by what power the disciples of our Savior gained credit from those who had from the first heard them and how they persuaded both Greeks and barbarians to think of him as the word of God, and how they set up in the midst of the cities and in all villages houses appropriated to the doctrine of the worship of the supreme God, and who is not also astonished at this when he considers with himself and feels satisfied that this could not have been of man, that never at any former time were the many nations of the whole creation subject to the one sovereign rule of the Romans, except only since the time of our Savior. For it happened immediately upon his passing about among men that the affairs of the Romans became great, that at that time Augustus was primarily the sole sovereign of many nations, and that his time Cleopatra was inflamed with love, and the traditionary kingdom of the Ptolemies of Egypt was dissolved. And from that time and until now, that kingdom which was from ancient time, and of it, as one might say, the ancient germ of men which was established in Egypt, have been rooted up. From that period, too, have the Jewish people been in subjection to the Romans, as has that in the manner of the Syrians, and the Cappadocians, and the Macedonians, and Bithynians, and the Greeks, and to speak collectively all the rest of those subject to the rule of the Romans, and that this did not come to pass without regard to the divine teaching of our Savior, who will not confess when he has considered that it would not have been easy for his disciples to be sent forth and to pass into foreign parts when all the nations were divided one against another, and when there was no one uniting element among them on account of the many satraps stationed in every place and in every city. But in the extirpation of these, they immediately, fearlessly, and with pleasure set about doing that which had been placed before them, because God, who is over all, had previously made their course peaceful, and had restrained the wrath of the worshippers of demons in the cities by the fear of the great empire. Considered then, if there had not been something to restrain those who had been stupefied with the error of a plurality of gods, how they would have contended with the doctrine of Christ. For you would doubtless have seen in every city and village commotions stirred up against each other with persecutions and wars of no mean description, had the worshippers of the demons possessed the sovereign rule over us. But now this also is a work of God who is over all, that he might subdue the enemies of his word, but by greater fear of a superior kingdom. For it was his will that his word should daily increase and extend itself to all mankind, and again, so that it should not be thought that it was by the connivance of the rulers and not by the superior power of God it took effect. And when any one of the tyrants was so elated by wickedness as to set about resisting the word of Christ, the God of all even allowed such at once to do his will, because he would afford proof to those combatants for establishing the worship of God, and also that it might be seen clearly by all men that it was not by the will of man that the word was established, but by the power of God himself. And who is not instantly amazed at things which usually come to pass in times such as these? For those ancient combatants from among men for the worship of God kept secret the nature of their superiority. At that time they became known and seen by all when they were adorned with the victories which were from God, while those who were the enemies of the worship of God received the punishments which were justly their due, chastised as they were by strokes sent from God, and their entire bodies wasted by grievous and incurable diseases, 
so as to have been speedily driven to confess their wickedness in opposing our Savior. But these, the rest of all those who were worthy of the divine name Christian, and who gloried in thinking of the things which belonged to Christ, did in a short time show being brought through trials and purity and refining of their minds, and that they had thus also obtained freedom for their souls, and soon did God cause that by their means the Word, the Savior, should arise as the sun on tens of thousands. The end of writing the five books of Asubius of Caesarea, which are called the Divine Manifestation.